morning everybody and welcome to our sunrise safari on a cool cool morning here at Juma. It's brought some welcome relief from the heat that we've been having over the last few days. Now my name is Tristan and on camera today I've got VM the Wildebeest once again and we are paired together to try and take you on an experience for the next three hours as we negotiate the African wilderness and that means that we are coming to you live and so you can get hold of us on hashtag safari live on Twitter or on YouTube chat if you would like to ask any questions or just interact in any way possible. Now, before I get into where I'm going to go today, I want to ask everybody, this is going to be a little quiz for everyone, and I'm going to give everyone a bit of time to identify this, because this little thing here, I want to try and see if anybody will be able to, sorry, VM, I'm going to try and hold it, if anybody is going to be able to ID this that I have got right here. It is a very difficult one. It is one to test the brain on the Friday morning for us here in South Africa, and maybe a Thursday evening if you're in other parts of the world but maybe you can give me an idea hashtag safari live or youtube chat what you think this particular little piece of whatever it is that i've got in my hand and we'll try and see i'm going to give you quite a bit of time to do it i'll probably won't address this again until a little bit later because it really is a tough one it's not something that you're going to be able to see very often and it is something that is quite sort of it's fairly flexible as you can see if i push it around it's quite soft it's got a bit of brown and green and let's see if anybody can work out what this is right now i found it in the car and that's why i wanted to do it you can see it's quite flimsy but i'm going to put it back there for a little bit later now i think for this morning what we're going to do vm and i is we've decided that we're going to go and probably check a bit of a boundary patrol so we're going to do a little boundary patrol check what's come in what's been around i had a report last night when i got back after drive brent's brother sent me a message to tell me that hosana had caught himself a little i think it was a little diker or something along those lines and it was moving towards the chitwa little gari boundary so might head down that way. It was also Tingana apparently. It was moving east from Vessels, which is a property that joins Chitwa on the southern side. And so we'll hopefully have some sort of leopard activity around Chitwa this morning. And that's why we're going to just do a little bit of a boundary patrol check for the Inkahumas if they've not come around. And then down towards Chitwa and try and see if we can follow up on one of our spotted cats. I think VM is desperately in need of a spotted individual to film again. And so that's where we're going to head. And hopefully we can get this right for all of you as well. Now, VM, should we go Impala Plains and then up north? That's what I think. Let's do that. So we're going to go... Impala Plains, and we're going to go northwards towards Sydney's Dam, and then from Sydney's Dam all the way along the Buffalo Cut Line, and then down towards Cheetah Cut Line and south, then into Chitra. That's going to be our plan for the morning. Now, I'm not the only one out here this morning. I am joined by my fearless co workers all the way in the Masai Mara, and there's none more fearless than Brent Leo Smith. So let's go across to him and say good morning. Well, good morning, good morning. We're on top of Cobalobit Hill, and we can see an ostrich far in the distance. It is another magnificent Mara morning, and oof, after the excitement of yesterday, let's hope today is just as exciting. Good morning, my name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Sébastien Rambi, the Frenchman from Guibon, on camera with me today, and... Uh, we had such a fantastic day yesterday. And I think we're going to head towards Lookout Hill, um, look for Malaika or or for um, Miali. I'm not sure yet. Uh, see which cheetah are around. I know Jamie's probably going to be searching for the five boys. She also had so much of the excitement yesterday. But remember, if you have any questions for us about this incredible ecosystem around us or the equally incredible ecosystem that is the greater Kruger, please feel free to ask us any questions you would like using the hashtag Safari Live. Now, we actually, normally when I'm out the side of the world, I like to be out of the door at 6 a.m. We were a little bit late this morning. Why do you think we were a little bit late? We have quite a good reason. There was a lion between our car and our tent. So <laughs> that is why it took us a little bit of time to get going this morning. We had to wait for a big male lion to move out of the way. Oh, wait, what's that? That is a water buck, not a big male lion. But yes, it was a big male lion. Um, so we got up at about quarter past five, um, poked our head outside, and directly between us and our tent, he was lying on the path serenading us at least he was giving us wonderful roars uh, his friend was on the other side of the river but yes it was very very loud uh, so there was no n sleeping in there was um 
tent vibrating. Um, it's better than an alarm call, having lions uh, roar you awake. But unfortunately, as I said, it was between the tent and the car, so we had to wait for him to move off. He unfortunately now then went down through the Sand River and into Tanzania. Okay. Time to carry on on our adventures. I'm so happy to be out there this morning, as I am most mornings to be out in the African bush. Now, someone who's probably as about as excitable as I am is Madame McCurdy. Oh, Brenty, we're missing the sound of your voice around camp. I am excited. It's a beautiful day in Kenya, well at least in the triangle and in the reserve. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Maintenance Craig. He's got a new name now as he's Mr. Fix-It around camp. But we also have a beautiful view to of course start the morning off. I know most of you I think really do appreciate uh, the incredible views as we come down this escarpment road. Now it causes a bit of a stir amongst the guests because a lot of them oh, <laughs> That one's a fail on both <laughs> I'm trying to duck Craig's trying to, sorry about that. But um a lot of the guests and, and just in people in general um don't like to come up and down this road. It's exceptionally bumpy. Though it looks a little bit better now. They've actually been repairing the roads. You can see a couple of rocks they've been digging out. All done by hand. And in, in the Sabi sand we use tractors and, and things like that to try and help sort the, the roads out. But yeah, everything is so well very much a hands-on job but how beautiful is that i like it though i have absolutely nothing bad to say about this road i think that the view makes up for the bumps and if you just sort of take it easy then it's not too sh not too bad at all isn't that incredible morning anthony you said great view thank you no thank you so much for sending through your comments now because this is live and interactive you can chat to us you can hashtag safari live on twitter or of course use the youtube chat whatever floats your boat shall we carry on craig now craig and i have decided that we're not settling for anything but high action today so we're going to be driving the escarpment road we're going to go all the way down actually i'm just thinking I can't stop. The steering wheel is locked. <laughs> Good to drive off the edge, cat. Unlock the steering wheel. So, we're going to basically, I think we'll just take this main road down, jump on the main road, and then go along the escarpment because this other one is really great, but it can take a bit of time. And I want to try and get to an area before, well, potentially where the sausage tree pride could be, or a female cheetah that we know has got young cubs. And I want to get there before the crowds get there, you know me, I like, I'm very selfish, I like to have sightings all to myself. Well, not, I have them and then of course I share them with all of you, but I'm not a fan of sharing them with many other vehicles. Let me say good morning to the zebra, hello zebra, good morning. Oh, no bricks. There, there you go. A couple of zebra, one hasn't quite decided that it's ready to wake up just yet two getting ready for the morning they look like young stallions little bachelor group around here not uncommon to see the zebras up on the plains oh very nice going over for a little bit of a scratching post oh that's nice you're not supposed to use your friend for that but you know I suppose anything is possible but it's not just myself and Brent and Tristan out this morning there's of course a fourth presenter and most of your favorites let's go across to my favorite Jamie Patterson oh Taylor that's definitely made my morning now I've got a big smile on my face and now I miss Taylor I mean we've been separated for a whole two days it's, it's quite a tough thing to deal with a very good morning to all of you and welcome to a very bumpy start to the Sunrise Safari. My name is Jamie and this morning Fergus is on camera with me and we're on the main road. These cars have this amazing, amazing internal massage system. All you got to do is drive on a main road and it does it for you. It's great. Safari massage system. Oh, don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter while we rattle away. I just want to get this part over with, so we're not going to stop. Well, we, we have to slow down for the bullies. But I'm not going to stop until we are off the main road and on our way to the five musketeers, the five cheetah brothers. For those of you that missed the sunset safari, we had quite the dramatic start. Oh, oh gosh, there's no good way about this. 
We had quite a dramatic start. The musketeers caught a, a wildebeest and then were chased off by a lion, but not before they chased a hyena away. So it really was quite a quite an adrenaline-filled afternoon. And then we spent the rest of the day with them, watching them rest, recover from what I'm sure was a bit of an adrenaline spike. So the plan is to head back to balloon crossing and then from there Ferg and I will be out all day. I don't know what we'll be showing you during the course of the day. I'm still hoping, still hoping for Imani, the female cheetah. I, don't get me wrong, I love the boys, but I really want to catch up with her again. It's difficult though. Try and find one female cheetah in this vast open expanse of wilderness. It's a little bit like needle in a haystack stuff. The rain hasn't helped. I mean, it has helped. It's helped the environment tremendously, but it hasn't done the road any good. Oh, this side's much nicer. I like this side. Um, if I'm not sure if it's Izzy or Ibby, and I apologize if I've got it wrong. But you want to know if we've got a favorite part of Izzy, Izzy, definitely not Ibby. Um, Izzy, you want to know if we have a favorite part of Amara. I've got a few, I've got a few favorite parts, and some of it's because it's really beautiful, and some of it is because of the memories that I have associated with it. Because that's always the best part about learning a new area, is building up memories in different places. I confess, this part is not my absolute favorite um, for a couple of reasons unfortunately that just is what it is I love being down by the Mara River Kitra Timber Crossing is one of my favorites the Sand River is also one of my favorites although unfortunately we're still working on getting comms and signal down that side and then excuse me little Sebi good morning I really like the escarpment road that Taylor's driving on at the moment and that's purely due to the sausage tree pride and the time that I've spent with them there. And where else do I really love? Oh, I think those are the main parts of it. I'm always going to be a river person. I'm a river person. So anywhere near a river or a river system, I really, really enjoy. There we go, I can see my turn off coming up ahead. Yay! Woohoo! You know, a serious shout out to our vehicles and our cameras for not more, raking more often than they do. Because they do endure, endure some really, really tough conditions. Okay, well I get us onto a smoother patch of road. Let's jump back all the way to South Africa to find out what Tristan has in store for you. Ah. Well, we're still just slowly moving towards the western boundary and just checking along, seeing if any signs of our lions or anything have come back. So far, nothing that we've seen. It's been a little on the quieter side. There's been one or two little impalas frolicking and, and running around and being quite active in this cooler weather. I'm sure if you're an antelope, you must be loving the fact that it's a little bit overcast after being scorched the last two days. It must be quite nice and, and quite a relief. The only thing is, though, I would imagine a lot of antelopes had a rather tough time last night because it must have been difficult when it's overcast like this windy. It makes it really hard for them to be able to see and hear what's going on and it makes it much easier for the predators to hunt so I might I would have imagined that there might have been a few successful predators last night hunting and so we'll have to just see maybe we get lucky and we can find a carcass or something now apparently we have some intriguing news or something that we have not seen in many many months and well regularly at least there has been the odd sighting but apparently there are tracks for a herd of buffalo coming onto Juma so we're going to try and see if we can find those buffalo I haven't seen a buffalo and I can't even remember how long well, at least not 
one that is alive. I've seen a few dead ones, but no alive ones. I think since maybe June or July was the last time I saw a, a buffalo alive. And so hopefully we will be able to find this little herd. It doesn't sound like a big herd at all. It just sounds like a few of them, but a few of them is better than no buffalo, that's for sure. And hopefully that will be the enticing magnet for the Inkahuma Pride to start coming back to this area and start heading in this direction. I just want to check here. This is often a place that the Inkahumas, when they do come back, like to come to. They come from Red Dam side and then they come lie in this area. Now, I believe some of you have guessed our little object that I showed you to start off things and to get things rolling. Let's see how clever you all are. VM reckons you're all going to get it. I'm not so sure. Jeff, you say a seed pod acacia? I'm afraid not, Jeff. It isn't from any seed at all. It's not a pod. It's a flat blade, if you want to call it. There's no pod structure to it. There's no seed inside it. So I'm afraid not an acacia pod. Let's see, is there anybody else that guessed anything? This is a tough one. I don't know if anyone will get this. I don't think anyone will get this. Miss KMP, you want you think a blade of grass? I'm afraid not. It's not a blade of grass. It looks very similar to a blade of grass, and it's kind of why I showed it to you because I thought a lot of you would think that it is a blade of grass. It isn't a blade of grass. It is not actually plant-based at all. So there we go. That's my first clue that I'll give you. It is not a plant. It is not from a tree, and it is not from grass. So if you can figure that out, then you might be on a winning track as to where this little thing is from or what it is that I showed you. It is, like I say, a very difficult one and I'm sure many of you probably will have never even have seen this before. It's not something, and it took me a while to figure it out And when we got to the car because it was on my seat and it took me a few kind of minutes just to think about what this actually could be. So it's going to be interesting to see if anybody does get it. I'll be super surprised actually because it's really not an easy one at all. But no sign of the Nkuma Pride where they like to lie. I was hoping that we were going to just find them all sprawled out on that open area to the left there, but it's unfortunate that they are not there at this stage. It seems as though they must still be on the western side of the reserve. But we have bait for them now, and I know that's a horrible way to, well, horrible thing to say about a buffalo, but it's true. They love buffalo, and if there are buffalo around, well, then you know that the lions generally will not be too far off. And in fact, actually, in all the months that we've been without buffalo, every Every single time there has been a buffalo that has set foot on Juma in the last, I would say, last four months, there has been the Nkuma Pride has arrived that very same day and has exterminated one of them. So let's hope that the Nkuma Pride is back, maybe not chasing the buffaloes around because it would be nice if the buffalo just settled a little bit and we ended up with some regular buffalo bulls in the area. That certainly would make life a lot better, but you never know. It seems to be the kind of knack that these Nkumas have is that they almost sniff them out and they know that as soon as there's a buffalo around it's time to head in this direction and it's time to start looking for food so I wonder if we're going to find any little tracks of that pride coming back this direction do we have any other guesses faith for our mystery object hmm Becca you wonder what are my scariest in Counter that I've had from in the bush, I would imagine. Um, sure, I've had a few. I must be honest. I, I mean, I've been most of them on foot. In fact, 99% of them have been on foot. I've been charged by lions. I've been charged by a leopard, which, in fact, it was Karula, and that's probably the scariest thing I've ever had. Is that? What have you seen, Vildi? Oh, nice. That's very cool. And so I think Karula's charge was probably one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I honestly thought that day I was going to be eaten. She ended up stopping about, I would say, a meter from me and growling and hissing and in really in a foul mood. And so there we go. There's a little magpie shrike totem pole, if you want to call it that. It's looking quite spiffy, that branch. They definitely are dressing it up and all the tails blowing in the wind. It's a very cool thing to see. <laughs> there's a nice little sort of pole of them all in a line. I quite like it. It's like our Ritz helmet strikes yesterday when they were all packed up together sort of cuddling for a bit of warmth. Now in terms of 
Um, well, I was saying, and scary experiences. Like I said, the, on foot, Karula charge was probably the worst that I've had. I have had a few charges from lions and elephants, um, rhino, buffalo, and they're all not great, to be honest. They, they're they pretty scary things to deal with. Those animals are massive, and, and when you're on foot and they're bearing down at you and, and you've got only a few meters between you and them and you realize just how big these animals are, it's quite kind of intimidating. So there's been a few of them, I must be honest. In a vehicle... Not too many, to be honest. I, I, I've, my vehicle has been hit by a rhino before, so a rhino shoved its horn straight up the front of the car and lifted the whole front end up. But it wasn't really that scary in, in that what happened was we came across a whole bunch of rhinos, females with a big male, and a male then wandered up the road. And he wasn't in any way really aggressive. He was just walking up the road, and he kind of saw us at the last minute, and then he just took a step forward and just shoved his head up and lifted the whole car up. It wasn't really like he charged at us, and it wasn't. it kind of was out of nowhere. So it didn't really feel scary and it was all fine. He kind of dropped the car again and walked off as though nothing had happened. So in terms of on the vehicle, very little. I mean, there's been the odd elephant chase that has kind of made me sort of heart race a little bit more. But all of the real scary stuff happens on foot. Now, Faith, I think you said it was Stephen that said that that little object was a feather. It is not a feather either. It is not from a bird, this particular little object. So I'm giving you all the hints to see say Steph sorry not Steven Steph so I'm giving you all the hints it's not from a bird it's not a plant it gives you a very big clue as to what it comes from right now I'm going to carry on and try and find these buffalo um, I believe that we are going to go to the Mara but I'm not sure Faith if you can just repeat who we're going to for me because I'm so busy thinking of a whole bunch of other things and where these buffalo might be that I'm not really focused it's also early in the morning and I'm still waking up so if we can go, there we go so faith has reminded me and that's perfect so we're going to go to the other male that's in the team at the moment seems as though Brent and I are being overrun by the ladies when we think that Jamie and Taylor are around as well and so Brenty we're going to have to pull up our socks and we're going to have to see who can come up with the goods first well the Thank you very much, Tristan. Of course, it's me coming up with the good stuff first. Look at that. It is a gorgeous little serval. Now, we actually saw it running at high speed away from some hyenas that were chasing it. And it's just managed to find a, a little patch of grass to duck behind now. Uh, I've, the hyenas, there's one, one of the hyenas that was chasing it. You can just see its back walking around. There we go. There were two hyenas chasing the serval. You managed to outstrip them quite quickly. And... Uh, now I was found a nice patch of grass to hide behind. It's really nice to see them during the day. Uh, we see them quite often at night, but this is this is so wonderful to actually spot them during the day. And you can just see how well that camouflage works when they duck down into the grass. You can see those massive ears scanning around, listening to see if the hyenas get close again. Oh, the flies are bothering him, or her. I didn't see whether it was a male or female. Look at those ears. Look how it's pointing in the direction that the hyenas are walking. Listening to every little thing. Now, the hyenas might... They're not really serious about chasing the serval. They're just for the joy of it, decided to chase the cat. <laughs> and uh, they will be far too slow to actually ever catch the serval normally. Now in this area, the, these serval are, are pretty relaxed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try move a little bit closer. Now, last night, just before we got to the Black Rock Pride, uh, we spotted a serval, and that was your first, Sebastian. And this Sebastian's second. He said he's he's been complaining to me that no one we've he has been here for three weeks hasn't seen a serval, and now we've seen two. And oh, it's hunting a bird. It just went after a little cesticula. The cesticula made quick of it, quick its disappearance. You can hear the little cesticula. <laughs> Now, 
Morning, book lover. Book lover would like to know, can servals climb trees? Indeed, they can, uh, but they choose not to most of the time. They prefer living in the grass, and that's where most of their food is. Uh, Shane, unfortunately for the serval, it's got spotted by the bird as it was trying to pounce on it. Yeah, let's try and move again a little bit. It was after a tiny little pectoral patch cesticular, tiny little bird. So what I do, I want to just get a, a nice view of its face through the grass. How's that, Seb? As I said, they're so relaxed in this area. Good morning, Anthony. Anthony would like to know, what is the biggest prey a serval will hunt? Um, I've, I've heard of them very rarely taking things like impala lambs, but probably in this area, the biggest thing they might attempt is a baby Thompson's gazelle. But normally they stick to small things like rodents and uh, birds are their two favorite plays. They also will eat big insects, big grasshoppers. Oh, they are just too gorgeous. You can see those radar dish ears hard at work scanning around now they've got a very particular hunting style especially in the longer grass I actually creep through and then almost leap vertically up in the air and land down with force um, upon normally a little rodent or whatnot I must say they are absolutely gorgeous see his ears or her ears on the job all the time I didn't do it once to know is a serval like like a house cat not at all um, they're they're very much a wild cat they're much they're much taller and bigger than a, than a house cat um, the closest thing to a house cat is an African wild cat and that's actually where the house cat comes from they were domesticated in ancient Egypt but a serval is is not at all all like a house cat and you can see how big its ears are in comparison to what you would see um, in a normal house cat or even an African wild cat it's still keeping a close eye on the hyenas which are still around it's a sub-adult hyena that looked looks like that was the one that was leading the charge the adult was just following it along and there we go you can see the hyena still there And you lose your serval. And the serval give you the slip. The serval line slip. Sniffity, sniffity, sniffity. Now, there is another animal that looks very, or has very similar markings to a serval. And hence, the serval has given some of its name to it. And I wonder if you guys know what animal that is. Hashtag Safari Live. What animal has a piece of the serval's name because their markings are very similar? It's so pretty. Just sitting in the grass, enjoying the morning, making sure the hyenas don't get too close. Now, while we we're going to leave our lovely little serval and go see if we can find a bigger spotted cat. It seems like Taylor has got something which would really like to avoid the attentions of a serval. That's true, Brent. We've got a beautiful long crested eagle, one of the prettier ones. I think, in my opinion, maybe a contender against the Batelier eagle, which we know has got the most beautiful colours. But that long crest and all the bits of white that they do have on them is, is stunning. Now, Craig actually spotted this eagle as we came around the corner. I was too busy yakking away. And he'd said that it it was, it looked like it dived into the grass. So we suspect that it's hunting. This would be a good time to hunt a lot of the rodents. And there are plenty of rodents as well at night. It's incredible to see them darting across the road. And, and that's what this thing will be looking for. It's probably um, some maybe giant pouched rats or three-stripe mice, four-stripe mice, sorry, or whatever it may be. And, and this is a very typical behavior of an eagle. So uh, especially a smaller eagle, you'll see the same thing happening with, with kestrels and with falcons, is that once they've spotted an area down on the ground that is rich, right, 
I'm not going to finish this. I will tell you a little bit about that at some point. Let's go across to Jamie. <laughs> Look at what we've just found. We've stumbled upon a situation where the five musketeers are walking straight down towards Balloon Crossing and they were about to go straight towards a herd of wildebeest. Now, the, this is where they take full advantage of sheer panic with the wildebeest and they seem to actually still be intently focused on them. There's a massive herd over there as you can see and the boys are beelining straight towards them. Now oh, which way are the wildebeest going to go? These boys capitalize on panic and wildebeest are not known for their steady nerves. There they go, they're off. Starting once again. Uh, Faith now would be a very good time for an action broadcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another dramatic scene out here in the Maasai Mara where five cheetah males are chasing after a herd of wildebeest, desperately seeking a weakness, looking for a way in. And you can see the wildebeest panicking, running around, stopping to try and work out exactly where the cheetah are and this is where these boys are so extraordinary because they hunt like lions and they capitalize on panic. You can see them stalking around the edges there. Now, all of this is happening live right here in the Maasai Mara of Kenya, where these five boys have gained serious notoriety in terms of their exceptional hunting skills. Look, you can see what they're doing. You can see the way that they're hunting. It's so different to the normal cheetah hunting technique. In t attempting to inspire panic, the wildebeest are now circling back towards us. There we go. The one on the left is jogging towards the herd, causing pandemonium. Our wildebeest can fight back, and sometimes they do. It's unusual. All right. This is f fascinating to witness. We're really learning so much. This is a completely unique hunting technique. These boys don't ambush, they don't creep up on things. They're just looking for a weakness. Look at this, they're just causing pandemonium and panic, waiting for one of the wildebeest to make an error. It's quite extraordinary. Where the wildebeest are going? Look at this, they're just pacing up and down. It's fascinating. Okay, we do need to get a bit closer yes. now. Let's, let's do it. Faith, there's a chance our signal might go a bit funny, but let's, I'll stay on the ridge. This is why I didn't want to stop on the main road. First thing in the morning, early, who knows what things are going to happen. They've spread out completely. One, two, three, four, can't find five, I don't know where five is. And once again, going straight towards the wildebeest herd. Happy there, Ferg? Yeah. Because we don't know which way they're going to go. You never know. You never know with this lot. They're basically herding them. There, I can see all five of them. They're essentially herding them. Perhaps they've decided to try out for sheepdog trials. Wildebeest herding, it's a whole new sport. Where are they trying to angle them towards? Excuse me, I will do Ferg. I'll keep an eye. The ones on the left are, are, are circling in. It's, it's incredible. They've actually in, almost encircled the wildebeest, not quite, but they surround them 180. Amazing. Um, there is a little bit of blockage here. So we have a question coming through about whether or not the wildebeest are blocked by a river or a lugger. There is a river here. We're at the Runkai River, um, right close to Balloon Crossing. So there is a very deep river system. 
Um, but the wildebeest could cross it, as we know, if they wanted to. And there's plenty of open plains still for them. But I think what these cheetah are doing is waiting for one of them to stumble, waiting for a weakness, waiting for one of them to get separated from the rest of the herd. Because at the moment, I think it's too dangerous for them to go barreling in there. So they're very close to the wildebeest. They've got them where they want them. They know that. But now they have to try and find a way to get in there without injuring themselves. And they're going to try and split up a herd and try and search for a, a little one, most likely. Although, as we've seen, they're more than capable of taking down an adult wildebeest. This is totally different hunting behavior to what we've seen with other individual cheetah. You can see the wildebeest stopping, staring at them, and the cheetah patiently waiting. They know the wildebeest are not going to run too far because the wildebeest don't want to be ambushed. So they've all gathered together in a group in safety, and they're now staring at the cheetah. These scenes are amazing. William, you want to know if they're perhaps wearing them down. They might be wearing their concentration down, but the, the cheetah don't have a hope when it comes to wildebeest stamina. There's one going on the left, trotting after them, but still quite far away. Now it's dashing after them. I don't think they're wearing them down. Wildebeest have probably the highest stamina level of any animal out here. Here it comes now. You can see that focus now really kicking into gear. It seems as though that cheetah's singled out a target now dashing bravely into the middle of them. Where are you going? What are you aiming for? Straight into the middle, panicking, separating them. Dashing backwards and forwards. Herding them back towards the rest, where the rest are jogging now into the middle again. I'll be staring at them. Where else in the world do you get scenes like this? Should we go a bit closer, Virg? Let's do it. Let's see that. Oh, there's a, there's a baby Tommy. There's a baby Tommy running straight in front of us. The cheetah are going for it. This little baby Tommy is startled. There goes cheetah full speed. Oh, straight over little baby Tommy, and it just doesn't have a hope. There's no way this little one's going to get away. Hopping over it, they're almost playing with the little one. Shame, poor little thing. Panicked at the wrong time which unfortunately is usually the end of Baby Thompson's. Now they're, now they're just toying with it. There's D'Artagnan chasing after it. Oh! Bailed over. Here comes a third cheetah moving in. Not really a meal for them. Come on, little baby. Oh, it's fighting so bravely. Here comes number four. Bowling it over. This is very hard to watch, I understand. It's hard for me to watch as well. Look at the wildebeest crowding in at the back. And it's all over for the baby Tommy. They've caught it. Oh, hopefully this death will be very quick for the little one. With five... ...have turned off. But if you are sensitive, this is not something you want to watch. It's difficult for all of us, I think. Oh, poor little thing. It's not injured yet, but these constant blows have dazed and confused it. And a few knocks to the head, oh, you can see, I mean, it really is. There's no way it's going to get away from all five. It would be extraordinary if it did, but it's not going to happen. Shame. Little thing's instinct is telling it to keep still. You can just see its little head there. That's what they do. They hide, they camouflage. Sorry, little baby. You ran at the wrong time. And for the wildebeest, perhaps a blessing in disguise. It's distracted the cheetahs from them, although they're still gathered around watching the scene play out. Oh, up again, up again. Anthony, you say that the wildebeest seem concerned for this little Tommy. Uh, they are concerned, but they're concerned for their own safety. So they're watching where the cheetah goes so that they can stay together in a group. Oh, come on, boys. Finish the job. Finish the job. This is a cat-like instinct now that's coming through. This instinct to chase and to play a little bit with their food. 
Julian, I agree. Just catch it. There we go. D'Artagnan's got it. But he still hasn't gone for the stranglehold. Come on, boy. I agree. Get it, get it done. Get it over with. It's so hard for us not to judge this from a human perspective. But remember, they're driven purely by instinct. There's no morality within this. So we can't judge them by human morality. But it is sad to watch. There we go. I think this might be it. I think it might be over. And the advantage that this little one has is the competition from the five of them. Okay. Should we get a little bit closer there? The wildebeest and... Oh, poor little Tommy is coming a bit closer. Okay, let me move before the Tommies come in front of me because I don't want to chase them towards the, towards the cheetah. Somewhere there is poor mum. Sorry, mummy. Wildebeest long gone now. Wildebeest are halfway back up the Runkai. Not a sufficient meal, but the baby Tommy's now dead. Just keep my vehicle shadow. Shadows are long at this time of day. I'll just keep it off them. The sun's coming up hazy and white and it's all over for the baby Tommy and in fact the meal is almost all over it's not much it's, that's basically a snack it's essentially when you order starters to share Jason I guess they don't do a calculation like that they don't do a, a calculation as to the energy that they exert in terms of the size of the prey, although I've seen them, I've seen them ignore smaller prey and go on towards bigger prey. I think the proximity of that baby Thompson was irresistible to their hunting instinct. They just couldn't stop themselves. There was no way that they could actually control that urge to chase a tiny running creature running past them. You know, it's it's like dangling a, a string in front of a pet cat and pulling it along the ground. They just they can't resist it. And that instinct is too powerful. So while they will walk past Thompson's gazelle if they're targeting wildebeest, the fact that the Thompson basically ran under their noses was, to them, they were basically drawn like moths to light. Here we go. At least it's all over for the baby Thompsons. The wildebeest have vanished. They've taken the opportunity now that they've realized that the cheetah's attention is diverted because that's why they were watching them. They were watching them to try and control their panic to make sure that the cheetah were not going to turn their focus to them. So they're the wildebeest all the way over there. Probably safe at this point. <laughs> Orchid Wave, as you asked that question, they're playing tug of war with the baby Thompsons. So Orchid Wave says it's amazing how they don't squabble when they eat. There's a little bit of aggression here. You see how each one is sort of frozen, not actually feeding, but trying to, trying to control the kill. Uh, they don't squabble nearly as much as a lion. If this were, if this were a lion kill, um, I think I it would be safe to say only one lion would actually get to feed at all. But they definitely don't have the same levels of aggression when they feed. They actually probably don't even have time for that. You know, they need to... We saw yesterday just how quickly they can lose their kill. They need to feed as fast as they can. And in this case, there really isn't all that much to go around. The, the carcass has actually been split in two. The group of three have got the bulk of it, and then the group of two, or the, the pair, off to the left have got the, the slightly smaller portion. I'm going to be quiet, listen. They were growling at each other a little bit. Well, growlings... <laughs> they were squeaking at each other. They've gone quiet as soon as I, as soon as I mentioned it. D'Artagnan's got his own piece of kill. And a little Thompson's gazelle, we saw Imani feed and eat an entire baby Tommy of that size not too long ago, and she ate it in one sitting in probably the space of about half an hour. 
so it really isn't going to go far between five boys but what you'll find is because it's a baby they'll eat most of the bones as well the bones are still soft and that will also provide them with a little bit of extra calcium their jaws aren't bone crushing like those of hyenas Octo, I've never noticed a, a, cheat, um, a lion eating in order, to be honest. Um, it's really sort of every lion for themselves that are killed. Certainly the male lion will find himself eating first because he's bigger and stronger. There they're growling again. Well, squeaking. consuming it as quickly as possible so no cheetah don't seem to have an order but what you will find is the one that's exhausted from the chase will often sit aside especially with a big kill will sit aside for a little bit and then start to feed as quickly as possible as soon as it's rested enough but when they really truly have exerted all of their strength and we spoke about stamina earlier cheetah don't really have great stamina they're short distance sprinters although these boys seem to break the mold but once they've rested a bit, then they'll immediately tuck in and feed. And they sort of rotate. And you'll find that at any dinner table, size usually matters. So the bigger, more aggressive individual will get to eat the most of the kill. But that is pretty much it. The first cheetah has moved away, going to rest after the chase. Okay, well these boys seem to have plenty planned for our morning and that was just the start, I think. We're going to sit here and see what they do next. Let's send you back across the continent to the southern tip where Tristan has found, lo and behold, something very rare on Juma. There lies a herd of buffalo. That is a sight for sore eyes and something we have not seen in many, many months. It's not a very big herd. I would say there's maybe between sort of 20 and 30, somewhere around there. But at least it's a herd of buffalo and it compromises of more than just bulls. There's a couple females in here. There's no young ones that I can see, but it's at least, like I say, a herd. And this is encouraging. And hopefully this means that we're going to start seeing more of these kind of things over the next little bit. They seem fairly relaxed. You can see they've all been lying down and taking it easy and they're in a bit of a thicket at the moment so it's quite tough to actually see all of them but they kind of spread out all lying around having a bit of a rest isn't that great so super cool to see like I say it's been a long time since I've even seen a buffalo let alone a herd of buffalo so to see a herd like this is absolutely wonderful and it's a good sign it means that the, the buffalo herds are starting to move a little bit more and starting to kind of check around and, and the green grazing that is now shot up in this area after a bit of rain that we've had will be attracting grazing species and it hopefully means that there will be a lot more buffalo hanging around. What is also good about this is whenever we get herds like this there inevitably will be one or two bulls that just decide well they've had enough of walking and will then just lay here and spend the rest of their time here and so you'll find a situation where a couple of the bulls might just kind of break off this herd and be a little bit more resident on Juma itself and so hopefully we're going to have a situation where this is the end of our buffalo drought so to speak and all those horns are a sight for sore eyes that's for sure and like I said it's been a long 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 time since we've had a visual like that of buffaloes here on Juma in fact I can't even remember the last time I saw a herd of buffalo on Juma I'm pretty sure the last time I saw a herd of buffalo was I think somewhere in the summer months. Even then, I don't even recall seeing a big herd around this area. The most of the, the herds that I've seen have been on Cheetah Plains since I've been at Safari Live, so nice to have, that's for sure. Becca, are you asking if all the buffalo in Africa are the same species so well no we've got this buffalo that you see here and then you get a forest buffalo that is one that occurs in the central parts of Africa there's a lot more red in coloration um, than what you see on these guys and also horn structure slightly different there are also water buffalo that are in the Cape area but those are there to be farmed they are actually not occurring naturally so it's just the forest buffalo and these guys that we get a Cape buffalo that we get here in South Africa so I mean in Africa so the two of them are the only species that I know of in the African continent.
that is naturally occurring that is of course like I say water buffalo have been brought in to Africa to farm now you might be asking what is the difference between a water buffalo and a cape buffalo and often when people come out here they refer to these buffalo as water buffalo now water buffalo is a very different animal it's a lot more relaxed than what you see from these guys and is naturally occurring in Asia and it's got very big horns but it seems to have not as bulky a sort of helmet like structure like you see on this male here that male's got what's called a boss and it's big and it's thick and it's and it's bulky whereas the water buffalo tend to have very long horns but not quite as thick and bulky as that on top and tend to be a lot more relaxed these guys tend to be quite aggressive and quite sort of grumpy about life and, and are a serious handful and are not an animal that is to be toyed around with and to be farmed and to be harvested or it's milk to be harvested it's really the water buffalo only that you can do that kind of thing with But I think they're going to be here for quite some time. They seem to be fairly well resting. They're kind of having a little snooze. They've come from Buffels Hook side. So they came from the Manuleti Buffels Hook area. They haven't come from the west. So if they'd come from the west, I would have been quite happy because that meant that maybe, just maybe, the Inkahuma Pride might have picked up on their scent and come this way. But they've come from the north. And so that means that hopefully, you know, they'll make a bit of noise and, and they'll spend a bit of time around here enough until the Inkahumas can pick up. You can see there's an ox picker. What are you? You doing ox picker it's almost getting into the mouth itself <laughs> ox pickers are funny things now sorry faith you're breaking up very badly I can't hear what you were saying the radio comms just went a bit funny there if you can just repeat it for me Kate Spids, I think it is. You say this is the cutest face that you've ever seen on a buffalo. Well, they are. So there's some cute little ones in here. The baby buffalo actually have very cute faces. I quite like baby buffalo. They're quite funny little animals, and they've got these cute little kind of cow-like faces. They, the bulls generally don't have very cute faces at all. They're normally battle-scarred and have gone through the sort of mill of being a, a male buffalo. It's not really easy. There's often a little bit of horn clashing, and also they just tend to look quite grumpy. But the younger buffalo tend to have cute faces. I quite like young buffalo. They seem to have a little character about them and I, I certainly can appreciate their sort of look and, and their cuteness that they've got. There is one massive individual in on the right hand side in terms of his horn size. He's a young male but his horns are huge. You can just see them sticking out above the top of everybody else's. He's kind of slowly dipping his head now but if you look at the back there, there is a sort of dark individual and there is his horns. Look at how long those are and those like I say it's not a very old male at all his horns are not pitted a lot there is not too much sort of chips out of it and, and breakage on that horn and, and his body size is quite small so he's still growing quite a bit and it's a pity he's now put his head down because just now he had his head up and it was quite evident just to see how big those horns actually are so there's one or two really nice sized individuals in here and the interesting thing is I was while just kind of sitting here I've been watching the condition of a lot of these buffalo and there's a little ox pecker having a bit of a grooming session just rubbing up on the horns um, and the condition of these buffalo is not actually very good so I would have thought that after this green growth they would have started packing on con a bit of weight but you can see a lot of their hips are still exposed they're not as bad as what they were a year ago a year ago um, we were seeing buffalo falling over like flies and, and just really dying all over the place and we had carcasses everywhere and ooh, that buffalo is not in good shape you can see that buffalo is quite thin and limping horribly and so that if any lion is around here is going to be the individual that they're going to go after it's quite common to see this in buffalo often a buffalo that is limping somewhere in the grouping they get so tormented by lions that they're often chased around and, and they put their hooves in ditches and overextend and, and just hurt the ligaments and all kinds of other things or even break the legs and so you often see a limping buffalo within a herd it's it's not an uncommon thing to see so shame that one if the lions do come about is probably going to be target number one there's a little one that's just lying down that William is showing us. Now if we look on the right hand side you'll also see a, a very light colored buffalo. So just there curled up right on the front sort of left hand side. Now that's a little 
baby buffalo, or young buffalo, and you can see its coloration is very different to that of everybody else. Everybody else is a more black coloration, whereas that is a light brown. Now, the reason why the calves are born a much lighter coloration than the adults is so that they can blend and camouflage a lot better. So what happens is as the herd's moving, they're often moving through grassy areas, and, and let's say a predator sees a big adult, they might miss these younger ones that are walking in the grass and are not too tall above the grass, and their coloration matches those grass stalks, and they can actually blend in a lot better than if they were born as a dark black individual. Also, their instinct, if a predator does, it happens is to come past as they're born, is just to lie down and stay dead still, and that will then maybe allow them their chance to get away. So, it's a clever strategy to have, and it's, it's a reason why they then have a different color to the adults. What's also very interesting with buffalo calves is that they have a very different suckling style to most other animals. Because this is a herd animal that moves constantly, and fortunately for buffalo, they require a lot of water and a lot of grazing, and what they don't eat, they often trample, and so they constantly are moving, and the herd is always kind of on the move, and that means that it's very difficult for calves, because calves ultimately have to suckle at some point, and if they are suckling, they then make themselves vulnerable to being preyed upon, because what happens is, is that the mother would then have to stop, and the calf suckles, and they would then basically fall off the back of the herd, and that's when predators are going to go after them, because the strength of the herd is no longer there. So what these little calves do is they'll actually suckle from between the mother's legs and so as she's walking in front of her the calf comes from behind and almost like a trailer of a vehicle just kind of latches on from between her back legs it means the mom can walk and still graze with the herd and so can the calf the calf can walk and still be able to suckle from its mother while the herd moves along and not be left behind which is very very clever and so they're one of the few species that does do it there's not many others that will do that it's not to say that they don't suckle from the side if they're in a situation like this where they're relaxing and they're not moving they will sometimes suckle from the side but a lot of the time it's from between the back legs but how wonderful is that to see? It was a very nice surprise for us here at Juma. It's, like I say, it's been a long time. And the nice thing about this is that they're right in the middle of Juma. The camp is just over there, and so they're very, very close. Ryan, you're wondering why it seems that the buffalo chew sideways when eating or ruminating. Well, it's just a way of grinding down their their food and so when they regurgitate balls their dental structure they've got these kind of flattened teeth with little ridges on them that are actually quite sharp if you ever find a buffalo skull and you run your finger over those teeth they're actually quite sharp but that sideways motion is kind of grinding and cutting at the same time so as they're pushing that ball between their teeth they're moving their teeth from side to side and those little ridges are cutting and, and slicing up those part those pieces of grass that they've eaten or leaves sometimes if buffalo are in desperate situation and it's just cutting them up into very, very fine little bits, and that then can be absorbed through the stomach. Remember that these are ruminating animals, and so they need to absorb as much nutrients from as little food as possible, and so they, they will grind it up into almost like a paste, and so they need to kind of move their mouth in that sideways motion just to squash everything down and cut it into those fine little pieces that the stomach can absorb every little bit of nutrients possible. I think we're going to probably leave our buffalo there for now. They're all quite relaxed. I, I think that they might head towards quarantine or even down towards Juma Dam later so maybe we'll come back a little bit later we're going to try and go and look for some leopards that I had tracks for just now I had a track for a male leopard I think it's in Vula's track because it comes from where he was last seen and is walking in a westerly direction so I'm going to go try and just track those and follow up on those but what a wonderful surprise I didn't expect to see these guys this morning that's for sure it's definitely a nice thing to see it oh sorry guys you can see they're a little bit on the skittish side when I started. Everybody stood up all at once, and so maybe they thought something was on its way in here coming to hunt them. But alas, we are not, so I'm sure everybody will settle down again once we decide to leave them. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to scare you all. Please don't run away. We like you having you here. Right, now I'm going to go and follow up on these leopard tracks, but Taylor Mack, who's out and about in the Masai Mara, is driving about, bumbling, and hopefully she's going to have some luck. It's a slow start to the morning, Tristan, but that's one of those things, isn't it? Craig and I have not seen an animal besides the odd bird flying across uh, for maybe the last 10 minutes now. So I don't think we're in a particularly good spot. 
and really say this about the Mara, as, as amazing what it is, and as many animals as there are, there's huge gaps where there's just nothing, of, you know, just vast emptiness, uh, other than, of course, stunning scenery. So, we had no luck with the sausage tree pride, no luck with the cheeses. I don't know where they've gone, but we know that they give us a sip and they do this every so often. That's all right. So now I'm deciding. Craig, this is going to be your call. Shall we head down towards the river or do you want to take the leopard road? Because we're, we're, we're just about to come up to the leopard road. Craig has spoken and he said we are going to try the leopard road again this morning. Maybe we'll be lucky. So we'll take the next grassy track off to the right and then start heading towards his favorite, like uh, checking at the tops of the Balanites trees where he often stores his warthogs. Now, a wonderful question from Kevin. You're wondering if uh, the entire Mara Reserve is fenced in. The answer to that is absolutely not. It's all completely open. Funny thing is, is that you obviously hear us talking about the various gates from the Olololo Gate, the Musiara Gate, the Talak Gate, the Purungat Bridge down in the south. So they're there, and it's literally just a station with a house and a boom gate. And somebody lets you in and out. That's it. So the animals, you know, can walk around and, and carry on moving freely wherever they want to. Uh, so, so yeah, so there's no fences, which is, which is so cool. Uh, I mean, they can go into Tanzania if they want to. And, and that's it. And they don't know any difference either. They just go where they please. But not all animals move around. A lot of them hold territories and will stay within their territories for, um, well, right until... From the beginning, the first day that they take their first breath to the, well, I suppose the last day, um, which is quite amazing if you think about it. Um, I'm just starting, oh, very quickly, let's go back across to Tristan. What's wrong with his back leg? He's been fighting with someone. Now, we've just left the buffalo, and parlors were alarm calling, and look exactly who's walking down the path. There is a Tingana leopard who has just chased his buffalo all over the place. The buffalo have run off. They got an absolute fright as Tingana came, and the impala started to alarm call. But what's interesting is that he's got a wound on the back of his leg, quite a big gaping wound. So he's obviously been fighting with somebody who I'm not quite sure, but he's definitely had a bit of a fight with somebody. He's walking fine, so he's okay. But it was super cool because we left the buffalo and this impala was staring into a bush and, and I was saying to VM it looks as though it's seen something and then it let out a snort and out popped Tingana right in front of us. Kevin, so a buffalo is not really on the prey list for a leopard. You can see Tingana's not really worried about them. The buffalo are all on the right-hand side here. They're just watching what's going on. But if there's a baby buffalo, then yes, a leopard can be very dangerous, particularly a male leopard like this. He can come into that area, and he can try and grab one of those baby buffalo. I've actually seen a male down in the south of the Sabi Sand called Kushan, who used to hunt the buffalo quite regularly. Campan male used to do it sometimes as well, and I wouldn't put it past Tingana to go after the buffalo. The buffalo are all watching on the right here. I think they got an absolute fright because there's also a male lion calling from not far away. We just heard a male lion roaring of somewhere around maybe um, Gauri cut line. And so I think the buffalo thought lion roaring, impala snorting, and then they just saw a cat that they panicked and ran. But I don't know how long we're going to be able to keep it Tingana for because he's going into seriously thick bush. It is very difficult to move around in here and we're going to struggle to keep up with him. But we're going to try our very very best it's wonder where he's been and what he's been up to because i know yesterday he was mating with moya and i wonder if maybe anderson didn't pick him up look how he's sniffing now he's smelling the grass there was tracks for another male leopard not far from here so i wonder if he hasn't just picked up the scent of maybe mvula but look at that's a proper gash that he's got there it's nice and pink and healthy so he's going to be okay i don't think he's going to be worried too much and the fact that he's walking the way he is you can see he's not really kind of limping in any way and, and you'll be surprised at how quickly something like that can heal the way that he's walking he's got his nose down now he's picked up the scent of something and it's not a buffalo he's picked up the scent i think of another leopard he's busy just kind of figuring it out you can see noses down all the time smelling there's all the buffalo in the background there so he's walking straight towards where they are you can see he's kind of and now he's turned again but the buffalo in the back over that side and then tingana and you can see he's not really paying attention to those buffalo 
at all. He's not hunting them. He's on another mission. His nose has scented something, and he's now trying to kind of work out what's going on. But how cool is that? Ah, leopards make me happy. <laughs> Heather, you say this is so exciting. I agree, Heather. It is super exciting to see this. Now, what's worrying me a little bit is that Tingana has come onto this area. He's got blood around the face as well. There's a big gash on his back leg. And so for me, I... wonder if he's not... He's picked up tracks for a young male around Spaghetti Junction and another young male track is on Cheetah Cutline and I hope he hasn't fought with any of our young boys because that will be a tragedy. He might have maybe fought with Anderson though. Where he was yesterday is deep in Anderson's territory and that might be why he's got a bit of a war wound. Anderson might have taken a little bit of an exception to this male leopard coming into his territory and, ha and mating with the females that he normally mates with. So that could be where it comes from. I'm hoping that's the case that rather than one of our young boys because if Tingana looks like that and he fought with one of our young boys then our, one of our young boys are not going to be looking very good that's for sure so hopefully fingers crossed that whoever he fought with doesn't really look too bad and that it was just a little superficial scuffle and that's the end of that Roshni, you're asking how do we know that that injury is a fight with a leopard and maybe not some other animal? Well, Roshni, we don't really. I mean, it's, I'm surmising here. It, given that he was mating, it, it, it means that there's a lot of noise and a lot of kind of vocalizing when they mate, and that often brings attention to them. And so other leopards then investigate and they come across one another. So it could be that. I mean, it, it could also be from a hyena. He might have had a kill that a hyena then tried to steal and nipped him on the back of the leg. I suppose that is possible. Something like a lion, unfortunately, if a lion got hold of him like that, he'd probably in all likelihood be dead. So I don't think it's a lion. So the only real options are another leopard that he's fought with or potentially a hyena that maybe bit him on the back of the leg trying to steal food. But normally with hyenas, if there's food available and they get into a bit of a scrap, the hyenas are more interested in the food. They don't really care for the, um, the actual... Um, you know, the animal, the leopard, they don't want to fight with the leopard, they just want the food itself. They don't want to fight with the leopard, they want to try and actually just get to the food and then take it. So, for me, this is more indicative of fighting with another leopard, but I could be wrong. Like I say, it could be something else that it is. I mean, it's, we're just surmising here. It's not a it's not a fact. I didn't say that he's definitely fought with another leopard. I just, it's a observation, and, and in my experience, normally when you see cuts and scrapes like this on a cat, it could be from from a, another leopard. Obviously, there's also one other possibility out of all of this which I didn't really think about until now and, and now that we're speaking about it, is that could very well be from a warthog. We saw last night lions hunting warthogs in the Mara and warthogs have got very, very sharp tusks and they can hook in and cause a lot of damage and so it could be from a warthog that nicked him on the back of the leg. It does almost look like it's kind of cut through the back of the, the leg itself and it's not really a bite mark so it might have been that now, Aegis, you want to know who's stronger, Tingana or Anderson? It's, that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, at the end of the day, I can't measure their power. I don't. There's no way of me, you know, saying to them, "You bench press a, a weight, and let's see who can do more." Um, in terms of size, Anderson is undoubtedly a little bit larger. There's, that's a fact of the matter. Is there's no real kind of. Um, argument there. He, I've seen the two of them walking side by side and there's most definitely a, a size difference and Anderson is slightly bigger than what we see from Tingana. But in saying that, Tingana is not small in his own right, make no mistake. And, I, and when they walked side by side, Tingana might have been slightly shorter, but he, I mean, he's not that much smaller. He's, he's still going to give a serious account of himself and he's got experience. Remember, he's older than Anderson, so he's got a bit more experience, a bit more street smarts. And so you know, it's it's a tough thing. I think both those male leopards know that they each each one is a really strong competitor, and they'll try and avoid each other more than actually going after one another. So it's just one of those kind of situations where um, it's difficult to say who's stronger. At the end of the day, Anderson is slightly bulkier and slightly bigger, and therefore you might find that he's just more imposing. But Tingana does have a much bigger dewlap than what Anderson does. But you see, he's sniffing. He's on a path of something. He's picked 
up some sort of scent that he's now wondering who's around here. That nose goes to the ground all the time as he tries to kind of negotiate his way through here. The problem is, is the way that he's heading now, there's absolutely no chance that we're going to be able to follow this individual and we're probably going to lose him fairly shortly. So Rexon's just going to cut in front of us quickly because he's going to try and just follow the leopard so that we don't lose him. Um, at the end of the day, it's very difficult for both Rex and myself to get through here, even with these smaller vehicles. Where we're heading now is really not easy. Peter Tingana is now about 12 years old, so he's getting on in age. Everyone always refers to Mvula as the old boy of this area, but Tingana is not much further behind. He's a few months younger than what Mvula is. So, you know, at the end of the day, they, they, he's getting older. These kind of injuries are going to start happening because he's moving around and he's, and he's still having to hold the territory, and there's lots of pressure from young males. If you think there's quarantine, there's Hosanna, there's Tamba, there's Anderson, um, and those are just the males that we know about. Then there's this this unknown male that keeps being seen on Biffle's Hook. There's Gajima. There's there's a lot of different competition around here. And so Tingana is going to unfortunately get wounds like this at times. Um, whether or not he's going to be able to sustain it and to keep himself alive in this section and, and keep himself dominant here for a long period, well that's debatable. But he definitely does have competition and, and he definitely is going to have a harder and harder time. The older he gets and the, the more power and stronger the young individuals get, the harder it's going to become for Tingana to survive in this area. Now, I'm just trying to get a gap here for VM to be able to see. There we go, Vildi. It's not great, I know, but it's, like I say, becoming harder to follow him. But he's still sniffing around. I don't know what he smelt. Something is piquing his interest, that's for sure. It's really... So while we watch Tingana and he moves off, I believe Jamie's cheetahs are up and moving, so let's quickly go across to her. Look at what we've got. The, you, you really, you, you'd think the wildebeest would have learned, but they've just come back. Straight back to where the, che the cheetah haven't moved, the wildebeest have come back to them. And now the boys are focused on finding something slightly larger for breakfast. They... That Thompson's gazelle was really just a little snack to whet their appetites, and now they're up and moving. All right, yes, definitely, Faith. Try the action broadcast. Let's see if we can make it work. There is nothing quite as focused as a five cheetah males approaching a herd of wildebeest and you can see them now moving with complete intent working together as a group to target the wildebeest that are moving across in front of them now you're watching this play out live in the Maasai Mara here in Kenya where these five cheetah males have taken this area by storm it's exceptional to see all five or to see a coalition of five cheetah they typically in either groups of two or three to so to see five is quite extraordinary and when you watch the way that they hunt you get an idea of just how much it works to their advantage and it allows them to tackle prey much much larger than a cheetah's regular meal now these five boys have just caught and eaten a baby thompson's gazelle it's barely touched sides for most of them in fact some of them haven't even managed to feed more than a few mouthfuls the herd of wildebeest that they were hunting originally have come back into this area now because this is live it means that you can send through questions and you can send through your questions now in the comments section below and we would love to hear from you ask us your questions because we can answer them as we go along the five boys stopping I have never ever seen a hunt like the one we saw earlier with but with these five cheetah males they encircled the herd of wildebeest um, spread out at almost a sort of 180 degree angle and they basically just tried to cause confusion and panic <clears throat> the wildebeest groups together like this it's too much of a risk for them to go barreling in and grab one 
Amy, you say that you love watching these beautiful animals. I do in as well. And speaking of me, I haven't actually introduced myself. We're going to keep the camera on the cheetah because we don't know when they're going to go. But my disembodied voice, my name is Jamie. And this morning, Fergus is on camera with me. So he's providing you with these stunning images. And this is all unfolding live from the Maasai Mara. There we go. A little bit of panic. And the one cheetah is heading forward to take advantage of it. These wildebeest, we're going to see the same standoff that we saw earlier these wildebeest moving together as a group they don't really want to let the cheetah out of their sight they know the cheetah are there but they don't really want to let them out of their sight because as long as they can keep an eye on them they can predict or try to predict what they're going to do whereas if they can't see the cheetah they're going to run away they they, they could be ambushed or they could run straight into them well now we're going back again in the opposite direction it would be fascinating to be in the head of a wildebeest to find out what drives them to move the way they do. Rebecca, that's the, the this group is exceptional. So you say that you thought cheetah hunted alone, and you are not wrong. Females do. Females are completely solitary unless they have cubs with them, um, uh, including slightly older cubs. There go the wildebeest cantering off again. Uh, but males stay together in coalitions, and the reason they do that is not for hunting, but because it allows them to protect a larger territory and to fend off other males. So that is why cheetahs form coalitions, but a coalition of five is very, very unusual. And that's why these boys are as closely studied as they are. You'll notice that the cheetah second from the right, sorry, second from the left, I've got my lefts and rights mixed up. Um, the second from the right, left, <laughs> is wearing a collar. Now uh, that's been put there by researchers to help keep track of uh, the movements of these cheetah. And they will gain some very valuable data from that. Are these boys going to make a move? You can see they're focused. Janet, from the hunts that I've witnessed with these five boys, they don't tend to all focus on the same animal until that animal has split away from the group and it's become very clear that that is their target. So I've seen them split into different groups and go after different animals but then when one of them manages to catch an individual antelope then the other four then move in they abandon their chase and they move in and they start to chase after the the same antelope and then they use their combined weight all five of them to bring them down remember an adult wildebeest is about four maybe even five times the weight of these cheetah brothers individually so they need to work together as a team. Oh, the wildebeest running back. You get an idea of just how panicked they are. And there is a little one there. Now watching the wildebeest run in the opposite direction. The wildebeest have stopped again. I, I shouldn't cast aspersions upon different animals, but I'm not sure that wildebeest are all that bright. When it comes to the, the different animals that we see out here, there are definitely some that are smarter than others. And I'm not entirely sure what these wildebeest are doing. It almost, I mean, the whole herd has now di disappeared off to the left, and these individuals have just gone dashing off to the right. And I'm not entirely sure that they know why they did that either. The youngster on the right is probably the one that's most at risk. Rishi, no. The wildebeest are not too big for these cheetah. They're too big for an individual cheetah, absolutely. A female on its own would never try and tackle a, an adult wildebeest. Maybe a wildebeest calf at its most vulnerable. There go the wildebeest dashing off now back to the protection of the vegetation over there. And the cheetah have just watched their comings and goings like they're watching a tennis match. And after their first initial burst... They haven't even tried to tackle them. But Rishi, yes, the five boys are capable, and we saw them yesterday, and we've seen them a few times, tackle and kill an adult wildebeest. Most of the time, though, it makes sense to go for the young, the injured, or the old, because, of course, that will, in turn, mean that their job is slightly easier. That wildebeest is slightly slower. That concludes, I would say, that cheetah hunt for now. They thought about it, they thought about spreading panic, but I think that for once the wildebeest have made the correct decision.
and that they are going to be okay. I don't think these cheetah males are going to go for either group. They've moved a little bit beyond where they are. But if that situation does change, then we will be back with you. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. We're going to say goodbye to those of you joining us for our action broadcast. But we most definitely will catch up with you again if something changes. Cheetah, what are you doing? But why? Okay, here we go. Full belly chase once again. Now stretching out, not quite top speed yet, but definitely targeting the wildebeest that are off to our right. Now going full speed. Look at this, look at the speed. Unbelievable, now full speed. Look at the look at this cheetah go. Racing after the group, the wildebeest now running away. Calling in panic, the little baby one. A cheetah's pulling up. Which side is it going to go? The others are dashing in as well. I'm going to turn around. Fergus is going to reach the end of his, the end of his range. Totally unexpected. Totally, totally unexpected. There they go. Here comes D'Artagnan running off to the right. Oh, there, there they go. There they go. They've got it. I can't believe it. They were waiting, they were biding their time for the exact right moment. One is still going off to the right, but they're targeting that adult as well. It's obviously the mother of the calf, it's distressed, it's cantering around. There's the little ones, and the cheetah did it, they've got it. Or did it get up? Nope, they've definitely got it. All right, there it is. And they're taking it, they've taken it down. All right, let's get a bit closer. Now that the five males have caught a proper breakfast as opposed to a baby Thompson's gazelle, all unfolding live here in the Masai Mara, bright into the sun. These boys are amazing. They really, they take my breath away. They are so skilled. All of a sudden, they just, they know exactly what they need to do. They were waiting for the wildebeest to be there. Let's get a bit closer, shall we? Yeah. Yeah, let's go. And we got a comment from Megan saying, go boys. Totally out of the blue. They didn't look like they were going to do anything. Just check there's no one coming to my right. Man, I did not see that coming. Totally incredible. Yes, Dart. You, you're a little slow. I'm going to beat you there. There we go. Sorry, Faith. I couldn't hear you over the sound of the engine. Why don't you just send through that question for me again? Bradley, oh, a little bit of a fight there. Bradley, you say nice catch. Absolutely. That was, this is now the second kill we've seen in the space of an hour. They really, they take my breath away. They absolutely do. This whole thing, this whole process is so smooth. It's so practiced. It's seamless, almost. And of the hunts that I've seen them attempt, I'm trying to think if I've seen them fail once. Sort of, I suppose, with those wildebeests, but that was because they were distracted by the by the baby Tommy. You can see the one on the left still holding on to the throat. So this baby is still probably alive, but it will be dead soon. Vanessa, you say two kills in 30 minutes or less. This, it, it's quite, I don't know, I'm actually taken aback, I'm at a loss for words. They really are, I mean, they are, there we go, baby wildebeest is dead. For those of you worried about it, I think it's now finished. It, they're just relentless and so incredibly skilled at what they do. 
the process just unfolds beautifully. I suppose having five very fast male cheetah, very strong male cheetah, is bound to work out this way. And so many people wondering if these boys are going to split. I don't think so. I don't think these boys are going to split. Hunter, no. They're not brothers, not all five of them. Uh, they, as far as we know, I believe that genetic tests are being done to try and determine exactly how these five boys are related to each other. You'll probably find a couple... You'll probably find their brothers, two, two are brothers and then three are brothers, and that they may be cousins, but we don't actually know that for certain. So when we do find out exactly how they're related to each other, then we will let you know, I promise. But we don't actually know whether or not they are... Now, for those of you that perhaps haven't been experiencing this drama from the very beginning, it started, our morning started off with these five cheetah males hunting and herding a herd of wildebeest, the same one that they've just caught this baby from. And during that whole process, a tiny baby Thompson's gazelle shot up from the grass where it had been hiding. It was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it distracted their attention because they're cats and it was dashing about aimlessly. It distracted their attention and they caught it and they ate it. And during that time, the wildebeest moved away safely to a really safe distance. Mm. You've got some breakfast on your upper lip there, buddy. But... During that whole process, the wildebeest ran away and then for some utterly bizarre reason came back and walked straight in front of the cheetah and immediately caught their attention. Now for a second there I thought that they were going to leave it. They were going to ignore that whole process and, and just let the wildebeest go, perhaps exhausted from chasing the little baby Tommy, perhaps with a touch of indigestion from trying to inhale the baby Tommy as quickly as possible. But in fact, they were just biding their time, and I think what they were doing was waiting for the wildebeest to move into a place where they could properly chase them without running the risk of running into the tree, tree line. And that's, I think, what they were doing. I think they were planning it out that way. So all of this has just happened live. It's unfolding first thing in the morning here in Kenya. It is nearly 8 o'clock in the morning, and these cheetah brothers, just like hobbits, have just had two breakfasts. Stanley, no. That is the amazing thing about the fact that there are five of them. They, you see that they are tucking into their meal very, very quickly, and that's because cheetah lose their kills to hyenas and lions all the time. But because there's five of them, we've actually seen them chase away one or two hyena on a regular basis. So the fact that there's five is a really large intimidating factor for a hyena, and although the hyenas come calling, and often in large numbers, and steal their kill, when it's just one or two individuals, then in that situation, the cheetah will be able to chase them away. What we saw yesterday during one of our action broadcasts was the cheetah caught an adult wildebeest, chased away a hyena, and then themselves were chased away and lost their kill to three lionesses. And that's why they're trying to eat as quickly as possible. There's no time for fighting or scrapping. Joe, you want to know where the fifth musketeer is? All five of them are here, but only four of them are feeding. There's D'Artagnan off at the back there. I don't know why he's separate from the rest of the group. I don't know why he hasn't started to feed. He's the gentleman with the collar, obviously, and that's why he has a name, D'Artagnan, because he's easy to recognize. He might be uh, exhausted. It might just be that he doesn't feel ready to eat yet, and because this is a large kill, he knows that he will still get something so it's not as urgent but you can see him panting really really heavily so he's cooling himself down recovering cheetah expend a huge amount of energy when they run that way and now it is interesting because i've seen i've seen this a few times d'artagnan seems to be the outcast of the group i don't know why it is but there's something about him and it i promise you it has nothing to do with the collar the animals don't see the collar that doesn't affect him in any way there is something i think it's his size he's the biggest of them and he 
always gets bullied. He's always a little bit away from the kill. He only ever feeds a bit afterwards. Now, I don't know if that's because he's keeping a watchful eye for predators or scavengers. I don't, I don't quite know. And often when we follow them, and we do follow them at night and during the day, he tends to be the recipient of uh, their anger and aggression. And all he'll do is walk up to one of them and they'll bowl him over and attack him and he'll fight back. And then they'll get up and go, they'll, the four will leave him and he'll walk quite far behind them but then they stop and they get worried and anxious and call him. Now I don't know exactly what goes on within the dynamics of a coalition this large. It could be because it's quite a young coalition, it could be there's a little bit of vying for dominance within the group but I don't know why it is that Dart is the one that's singled out. It always seems to be him. Every single time I've followed these cheetah and I've spent good few hours with them he seems to be the target hey boy I think it's because you're the biggest personally you present the biggest threat <laughs> but don't worry he will get to feed I promise you he will get to feed it's also that the cheetah are sort of crowded in around the carcass so there's not that much space and perhaps he's just being magnanimous I don't think so though he was very far behind during that entire process Mr. P, they ate the entire baby Tommy. It was quite a young, here comes Dart, he's going to come and join them. I'm just constantly looking around because you never know when a scavenger is going to appear or a lion attracted by the sound of that kill. It wasn't a silent kill like the baby Tommy. But sorry, Mr. P, speaking of the baby Tommy, they ate the entire baby Tommy, bones and all, um, or most bones and all. They essentially consumed it in the space of about 15 minutes. It was very small, very soft bones because it was a baby, and as a result, it, yeah, it was gone in, in a few minutes. Let's see how the situation plays out. I'm going to be quiet in case we get some sounds from them. There we go. Peaceful. Peaceful. One of the cheetahs budged up for him a little bit. Or possibly to just take the best feeding position before he did. I'm not sure. And there we go. See how alert their body posture is. Glancing over their shoulders, they don't want to get caught unawares by a lion sneaking up on them. That would be deadly or poten potentially deadly. I'm just going to be quiet for a little bit longer so you can hear the squeaks. Let's see if they keep doing it. <laughs> 